And with that, we will begin today's session. First, I want to welcome you to healthcare where you want it, when you want it, can mobile deliver. That is today's topic, and this is the sixth Quill monthly webinar session. Good afternoon. I'm Steve Selbst. I'm a Quill healthcare consultant, and I would first like to introduce my colleague, Ms. Regina Vasquez. Regina, say hi. Hello, everyone. Okay, well done. Uh, between, between us, we have over 30 years of healthcare consulting experience, and we specialize in a variety of areas uh, for practices, including payer contracting and analysis, negotiations, credentialing, and marketing practices services to payers and to employer groups. Together, we have negotiated and analyzed well over 10,000 payer contracts. Today, I am pleased to host, as I mentioned, the sixth in our monthly series of value-added webinars for Quill Healthcare. Quill Healthcare is the leading seller of medical supplies and office products and is dedicated to providing you with useful content in these webinars as a value add to your practice. Today's topic, healthcare where you want it, when you want it, can mobile deliver, is being presented by Ms. Shirley Abbott, the IBM Worldwide Industry Marketing Manager for Healthcare and Life Sciences. In a moment, I will introduce uh, Shirley and give her the proper introduction that she most certainly deserves. But first, I couldn't resist telling you that there are a couple of um, areas that Shirley and I have in common. One you might have guessed is our first names both begin with S. But it doesn't stop there. Actually, uh, in a prior life, I was an IBM program director in IBM Software Group uh, in a small company that uh, Shirley is a an, an executive at. And um, one of the things that has impressed me about where IBM has come in the last number of years is the convergence of mobile technologies into the healthcare space. And in particular, another small company, I believe it has the largest market cap of any company in the world today, Apple Computer and IBM recently embarked on a relationship in this space. Whoops, I hear somebody's door opening. This means I must mute all lines. We will try again. Okay, and what I will do when we get to um, the question and answer mode is uh, uh, free up the line so that you may go ahead and ask uh, questions. But anyhow, uh, one of the areas that um, IBM and Apple have partnered in is, in fact, um, healthcare applications. And uh, I expect that Shirley will be telling you a little bit about that and where this uh, partnership leads. Um, let me just uh, pause for a moment and ask uh, a couple of the participants. I see uh, something coming across saying there's just telephone audio. Uh, let me page and see if others can see the session. Uh, Regina and Shirley, are you able to see charts at this time? Yeah, I'm able to see the PowerPoint, yes. Can you see scrolling? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, for for those that are having difficulty um, viewing the session, please go to either join.me slash healthsense. That's join.me slash healthsense, H-E-A-L-T-H-C-E-N-T-S or simply go to the URL join.me and uh, type in HealthSense in the green section, H-E-A-L-T-H-C-E-N-T-S, to join the session. Uh, but as far as I can tell, having done a quick validation, um, the infrastructure for the webinar is operational, so if you are having difficulty, uh, please, take that, please take that step. 
Okay, before we get started, I would like to uh, also point out a couple of uh, quick items. First, if at any time during the session you think of a question that you would like to ask uh, during our Q&A sessions, and we'll have at least two or three breaks for that purpose, please at any time send an email to the email ID displayed here, which is info at healthsense.com. You may do that at any time throughout the session. And my colleague, Ms. Regina Vasquez, will pick up the questions and um, will actually ask those questions for you. Or what you may do during the breaks is go ahead and hit asterisk six, tap asterisk six on your key phone keyboard, and that will free up your phone line where you may ask a question. And then uh, for tidiness, uh, so that we don't hear the background noise after you're done speaking, if you could please, after asking your question and conversing with Shirley, please once again press asterisk six and that will mute your line. So two ways to ask questions at any time beginning right now, feel free to send an email to info at healthsense.com. And in fact, uh, you know, if you're having trouble getting into the session, go ahead and send an email there as well and Regina can help you on the sidelines here uh, get connected. Or during breaks, go ahead and um, tap asterisk six on your phone keyboard to ask a question. And again, if you have any trouble accessing uh, the webinar uh, session at any point in time on your screen, simply go to join.me slash healthsense, that's join.me slash healthsense, H-E-A-L-T-H-C-E-N-T-S for those that can't uh, see it on the screen, and you will be instantly reconnected into the webinar. Okay, now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our guest speaker. Ms. Shirley Abbott is a certified healthcare administrator through the American Academy of Medical Administrators, the AAMA. She has many years of experience in the private sector and in military healthcare. She is a Project Management Institute PMP certified project manager with many years of successful experience on performance-based complex projects. Interestingly, she is also married to a subspecialty medicine physician who owns his own practice, and she provides, as you might expect, business insight into the running of, of his practice. In her current executive management role in IBM Software Group, Ms. Abbott assists global sellers in understanding issues facing healthcare and life sciences and how various IBM products can be brought together to effectively solve those issues. She works with IBM and client teams to develop strategies for integration, business process management, operational decision making, and mobile products to assist them in finding solutions. And I couldn't be more delighted to be able to have a speaker with Shirley's breadth of background, experience in practices, and understanding of mobile technologies to be a featured speaker in this session. So without uh, further ado, I'd like to turn the floor over to Ms. Shirley Abbott. Shirley? Great. Thanks, Steve. Um, so, hello, everyone, and thank you for allowing me the opportunity to spend a little time with you today talking about mobile technology and how you can use it in your day-to-day -day business. Um, I'll tell a little story about myself, and that is I started out at my local hospital working as a candy striper when I was 15. I won't tell you how old I am or how many years I've been in the business because then you'd actually know how old I am. But um, as Steve mentioned, my primary um, work in, in healthcare administration is actually in the Air Force, 23 years in the Air Force, and my husband is a medical oncologist, and we live in, in Maryland. And so I do still I had the, have had the opportunity to um, spend quite a bit of time in his office um, over the years as he's had employees who some were good and some who were not quite so good. So I've done quite a bit of work down there, and I have to say it was really quite eye-opening for me being actually in the practice and watching, watching how things actually went on. So when the opportunity to talk about mobile came up, that actually is a product line that's in the area that I work in. And, you know, the, the smaller healthcare practices are really near and dear to my heart because of my husband and the community that we live in. We live in a rural community, and so a community-type hospital setting where most of the practices are physician-owned. And I said, oh, gosh, yeah, I'd really like to actually come and, and do that because that sounds like a lot of fun. And, you know, I want to talk about um, 
what can you do in your practices to make it better possibly. So the challenge is that we have kind of a diverse group of people possibly on the telephone, and I'm going to query you in just a little bit to actually see who that group is. But um, as I was doing some additional research to determine what to talk about that really actually applies to all practices, so medical practices, dental practices, veterinary practices, it was really almost overwhelming how much information is out there. Um, you can pick up just about any healthcare journal, article, magazine, and read something about mobile. So it's very clear that mobile and the ability to incorporate mobility really is impacting now how organizations conduct their business and are going to continue to conduct their business in the future. Mobile devices have just grown and really transcended from being a consumer-only device where we remember the days when you got the cell phone and it, the greatest thing was you could take a telephone call wherever you were at to, to today where cell phones and mobile devices are really em, empowering the enterprise workforce to do day-to-day -day activities anywhere. In fact, I venture to say that many of you rarely actually use your mobile device or cell phone actually as a telephone. You probably use it for a whole lot of other things. So it's interesting to me how much the technology has grown and what we are able to do with it. This really isn't only happening in the U.S., but it's happening around the world as well. And you can almost go to any country, almost any country, regardless of economic status, and you'll see that just about everyone has a mobile telephone or a mobile device. So with that said, let's, let's talk about um, the fact that, by and large, I really think the transformative impact of mobility in the healthcare community hasn't really been fully comprehended by the lot of by the enterprises and I think that that's especially true in the healthcare industry. Mobile is being treated by many industries in what I would call a supplementary addition to the existing infrastructure and industries are not really utilizing the full benefits of mobility and they often restrict it to a single functional use. And and I'll use an example in the banking industry even though that's not our industry, but Banks are content with providing mobile as just kind of another transaction channel, but they don't really leverage mobile um, to create innovative ways of payments and transactions. So similarly, many mobile, many enterprises' mobile servers serves as either a way to connect or just kind of another way to access information. But it really seems to me obvious that mobility is going to be at the center of a major transformation to this digital enterprise and what we're working towards. And to make this change, I think you have to think about, when I say enterprise, I'm talking about your practices. Enterprises and practices need a mobile strategy if that's what you want to do in order to be more than just a layer of infrastructure that goes on top of what you already do. Your mobile strategy has to be planned from the bottom up all the way to the top and then right back down again through every layer in the organization and its infrastructure. And again, we're going to kind of get to this in just a minute, but it'll be interesting to hear the size of your practices and, and how large you are because I know we could go from practices the size of one to two individuals up to um, some number of hundreds. So w what's up with healthcare as an industry? What are we doing? Um, and, and I think that healthcare as an industry is undergoing a lot of change. I think that you probably see this yourself not as recipients of healthcare wherever you live, and as well as being individuals who work day to day in the industry. Like yourselves, our patients are demanding affordable, evidence based, personalized care, and healthcare organizations, your practices, are expected to deliver those re results with greater value, improved quality, and lower costs. And it doesn't matter how large or small the practice is. If the patient um, or if your patient population actually wags their tail and gives sloppy kisses um, or whether you're the two-legged kind, everybody wants value for their money. Um, and I think that we're seeing that quite a bit now. For years in the U.S., our health and social systems have been interdependent but yet have largely operated independently of each other. As the world grows more interconnected, this really is changing, and globally, the healthcare industry is moving towards a patient-centric, coordinated, and more accountable care model. And I think that because you work in the industry, you actually see that far more than, you know, than the normal lay person actually would. So in healthcare, we see some common objectives across the globe and across the continu continuum of care, which include putting the brakes on costs, improving quality and outcomes, and eliminating disparities in access to care. And we're going to talk about some of that today. 
throughout the industry, what we're seeing is that forward-thinking organizations are developing solutions and other types of new competencies and using them to actually reduce costs, increase access, and improve outcomes. And today's mobile technologies really are enabling real transformation. They're redefining relationships and opening new avenues for payers and providers alike. They're engaging and empowering individuals in their own health decisions and providing better coordinated resources and really extending the, extending the reach of healthcare services across the communities. And you may very well be individuals, and we're going to talk about that, and I might pull you on that just in a little bit. You may very well be individuals who really, really like mobile technology and use it. And if you're, I would say, under the age of 30, that probably definitely applies. Over the age of 30, not perhaps as much, but under the age of 30, look at anyone under the age of 30 and even 25 and under, and they always have their mobile device in their hand. So the last few years in the U.S. Um, and around the globe, we've really seen some incredible technology changes that are improving access to information and people's ability to engage in health care for themselves and their family members. And remember, when I say family members, I'm speaking about our four-legged family members as well. Cell phones really dominate the marketplace, and, and they're not just used to make telephone calls. In fact, it's more than likely that they're not used. I think I mentioned that a moment ago. And if we had, could have a show of hands, which, of course, I can't see, it would be interesting to see how many people have just a telephone that really is just a telephone. I, I'm kind of betting that most people do not. And really, I find it's really kind of scary sometimes to work in healthcare right now in trying to keep up not only with what people want, but what really is right for the patients and the clinicians in the practice. There's just so many changes going on. And then you add in all of the federal regulations in the U.S. that we deal with, um, it really becomes scary sometimes. But I do think that you'd agree with me that mobile has really vastly changed how, as individuals, we communicate, we share, and even live. So let's kind of go off and start to look at how mobile can change how we run the businesses and even how we work. And before that, um, let me just add that uh, your practice may have already implemented some of these items. And if so, when we have our first question and answer uh, period, I'd be interested to hear from you what you've done and what you feel works and does not work for your practice. Because, you know, as much as I'm interested to talk to you about what we think is significant, it's really good to hear from you all who have actually possibly done this and, and let the rest of us know what will actually work and what doesn't work. So let me ask you this. Um, what do you think about when I say the word mobile and mobile technology? For me, when I use and think about the word mobile, I think about convenience and time efficiency. My days are really all about managing my time to get done all the things that I need to, um, probably very similar to yourselves. And it's really true what my mother always said to me when I was growing up, and that is the older you get, time fat passes faster. And I don't know if you have noticed that, but for me, it really seems to be the case. So for me, it's all about efficiencies of scale and being able to manage my time, and mobile helps me to do that. And there never really does, even with mobile, seem to be enough time during the day to get things done. So many ways, there's many ways that you can use mobile technology, um, not all of which are going to be practical or even affordable for smaller healthcare practices. So I may say to you or talk to you about some things where you think, wow, I kind of like to do that, <clears throat> and how would we actually do that in the practice? You know, um, I don't believe that we're talking to the Mayo Clinics or the NIHs of the world, and those larger institutions are likely to be you know, staffed and funded to do some of the larger initiatives I might talk about. But I'm going to talk about partnerships possibly with some of those organizations um, and see if they can't be feasible to be done that way. So as we go through today's um, presentation and talk about mobile, let me tell you what I think a mobile device is so that we're on the same page with this. So for, you know, in my world, a mobile device really has four defining characteristics. It's portable. Um, meaning a portable device like typically has a battery powered, um, has some form of computing re resources in the form of a processor, memory storage, and network access, and those types of things. Typically, they're thin and lightweight, um, although some of the newer phones are rather large screens, and it makes them kind of easy to carry and use them anywhere. 
they're connected, so they're always connected to some type of a communication network. And this, you know, enables the device to send and receive any information from anywhere and also while you're on the move. Um, they're also capable of communicating with machines and humans. They're personal, so the devices aren't shared. They're intimately, if you will, attached to an individual person typically. They're used by individuals for personal communications, storing and sharing of, um, of data, and to perform personal activities, so for example, a bank transaction. And they're also intelligent. So a mobile device has, you know, some, I mentioned this before, some internal computing capabilities. It's capable of receiving information and performing operations on, on data based on user input, and then it gives you a result. So based on the characteristics that I just gave you, um, I would say to you or offer to you that the following types of devices are understood to be mobile devices, and those are smartphones, tablets, and wearables. Okay? So now that I've told you that, and we're on the same definition of what a mobile device is, let's take a look at what's driving the technology transformation in healthcare. So I'm going to talk about on the next slide um, this IBM Global Technology Outlook 2014 megatrends um, study that was actually done. Shirley, just a quick reminder, if you could orient to the uh, specific uh, page, that would be helpful during the presentation. Okay. Oh. So that is not my page. All right, so hold on just a moment, you guys, because we're I'm using off my slides that have notes, which you guys don't have. Um, if you'll go back up, back one, Steve, to where you were at. I'll go make myself be there. Yeah, if you could uh, track here, that'd be great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm going to have to kind of watch you, because somehow this is... All right, we got a little bit disorganized here. Sorry, everybody. Okay, so we're looking at some t statistics here at this point. Um, we're not looking at some statistics. Okay, here we go. Hang on one second. So we're all looking at this little human being here. Um, there's three really major trends in healthcare that are driving this massive transformation that we're seeing. And again, working in the industry, I think that you see this a lot. Care delivery is evolving. Um, Again, we're going to, I'm going to learn hopefully in just a few minutes what kind of practice that you're involved in, whether it's primary care, specialty, dental, or, or veterinary. But in the human being world, we have aging populations around the globe. Um, that, that aging population in and of itself lends us to this steady rise in the incidence of chronic diseases. It's creating really unsustainable press, cost pressures on the health systems. We've had some really great advances in medicine. Um, but there's a cost that comes with that, and we've created this population and requiring treatment that has never existed. And I'll, and I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, I'll use myself for a lot of these examples so no one feels picked on. I have a mother who just happens to have turned 96 years old recently. So 20 years ago, how many 96-year-old patients did you have in your practice? And the challenges that come with that and the conditions that they have that we never used to see. The advances in medicine have allowed our patients to live longer, and now they come with different problems that we never expected to actually happen. Um, similarly, our four-legged family members, our pets, live longer, and in many cases often received advanced medical care that even 10 years ago would not have been available to them. You know, in the two-legged arena, buyers of, you know, buyers of care, and this includes kind of government, private insurers, you know, employers, individuals, everybody expects greater value, improved quality, and better outcomes. They all want more affordable costs. And, and even we see that in the veterinary world and in the dental world. You can't pick up a healthcare article these days without seeing discussion on how the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services plans to transition reimbursement based on quality and value. And that actually starts to become a little bit disconcerting when you look, when you get outside of the primary care area and into pretty much anywhere else. How do you determine what is quality when you are a medical oncologist or a surgical oncologist? I think that's going to be very interesting to watch and see how that flows. So it's up to us to figure out how we offer services that will have our patients provide back good ratings if we're affected by this to the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services because now that's going to tie directly back to your reimbursement. 
So the second trend that we're seeing is the business models in the healthcare ecosystem are converging. As the demographic shifts continue, there's an increased demand for health services. I think I mentioned that, placing more pressure on the healthcare systems to rethink business models, partnerships, and even creative delivery of service. So how do we do this? You know, how do we how do we make this work? Some of this is really resulting in people having more choice in um, who they actually see. Or one of the more common ones is have you you know studied about the doctor is going to do some type of a procedure? There's two places that you the patient can go for the procedure that their insurance covers. And what do we do? We now go and we look to see what's my total out-of-pocket cost going to be at both of the lo those locations. And I'm going to pick the place likely that is less costly to me and cost me and you know have my out-of-pocket cost. So the last trend that we're going to see is the focus is really turning to the individual. Um, and a lot of what I'm going to talk about today focuses and t <clears throat> excuse me <clears throat> ties back to focusing on the individual. So I would offer for your consideration this thought, and that is that healthcare has started to become a consumerism or consumer consumer driven business. And what I mean by that is consumerism focuses in the retail typical retail um, definition, consumerism focuses on the needs and preferences of the consumer, in our case, the patients, okay? So we're going to use the term consumer and patients interchangeably. Consumerism is understanding and influencing their buying behavior, and it's delivering high-value service and products relevant to the consumer and producing end outcomes beneficial to the consumer and the seller. So. You might have seen some of this in your own practices already. So some of the reasons that I think we are seeing the shift to consumer, consumer, consumerism in healthcare, that's not so easy to say, in the two-legged world is cost shifting. Especially in the last couple of years, we started to see out-of-pocket costs really increasing for individual healthcare consumers. Um, there's an increase in the use of high deductible plans and healthcare savings accounts which really leads to more consumer price sensitivity. When they have to pay out of pocket, they're much more focused on, um, on, how, on what things cost and how they have to pay. People want to spend their money and, they, they, and spend it wisely. They work hard for the money. We all work hard for our checks, so why do I want to spend more for something if I can get the same quality done somewhere else for one half the price? So. We're, we don't even really work in the same state of operation as we did 10 years ago where you went to the same doctor for your life, the patient never asked any questions. I think those days are long gone. And I'll give you an example of consumerism. Literally just yesterday, I'm sitting at the vet's office um, this, next to this really cute Jack Russell puppy who is in for her last booster shot series. The mom tells me she's getting spayed on Friday, so I make a comment that, oh, yeah, after that she won't like coming to the vet's office. And mom leans over and tells me that, oh, I'm not having the procedure done at this vet. She's going to such and such a location, you know, so in, in, in the town down the road, because it's one half the price of what the vet's office that we're sitting in <clears throat> would charge to spay the dog. And so I found that very interesting. And again, some of that is identical to what we see in the two-legged consumerism model. People want value for their money. If they can get the same quality, they're going to go where they can get the best value. So let's go to the next slide and take a look at some of the market and legislative forces, forces and challenges that as businesses I think that you're facing. And I'll make sure I'm on the same slide here. <laughs> okay, good. And we are, and we are, yay, okay. So I think that the changes in healthcare that we're seeing today are fueled by a number of things. And you can see them on the slides. I've listed several of them. As businesses, your challenge to adapt to the consumer-centric healthcare ecosystem, and I think this is the same regardless of the type of the healthcare practice. It doesn't matter if you're a dentist or if you're a veterinary practice or even if you're a, some kind of a people, two-legged people practice. You still have to adapt to this con consumer-centric environment you live in. I read a couple of interesting quotes I want to share. <clears throat> the first is, the future of healthcare will be drilled driven by consumers and the increasing role they will play in managing their health and healthcare finances. This was, <coughs> excuse me, 
the Anthem CMO CEO Joseph Swedish. Um, oh, I'm sorry, no, it wasn't. This is um, the Aetna CEO Mark Bertolini. The Anthem CEO said, "We are no longer a health insurer. We are truly a health plan engaging with individuals as opposed with large blocks of business." And I really think that they have both realized, as insurance payers, it has become a very consumer centric type of um, society that we live in. So what did 2014 bring us that we've not ever before be seen in the United States? And I know you guys know these three words because you've probably been very much impacted by it, and that is the Affordable Care Act. That really changed in the huge way how healthcare in this country is allowing individuals to purchase their health care via different plans, different companies. And, and now these companies are all competing for business. That's consumerism. So I had the opportunity last summer to speak to the Blue Cross Blue Shield Association. And one of the discussion topics that they had and wanted to talk about was the fact that they are now having to compete for patients based on what the patients want. And what, what we spent a lot of our time talking about was what are those things that you can do to attract and keep your patients? And so their concern was and their focus was on mobile and social technologies that are empowering um, uh, individuals and creating this opportunity in some ways for consumerism to exist. And you might have just heard my four, one of my four-legged family members speak to the telephone there. Um, so anyhow, there's this really an increased focus on improving the consumer experience because your consumers are consumer, your patients are consumers of healthcare. And I have a an article by the um, International Data Corporation. The acronym is IDC, and they are a global market intelligence firm. And they predicted that 65% of consumer mo of consumer mobile applications, wearables, and remote. How did I? Let me see. Let me start over with that again. Sorry, the IDC um, predicted that 65% of computer mobile applications, wearables, remote health monitoring, and virtual care will increase by 65% in 2018. So I think that that's very interesting. Um, so again, I want to talk about consumer-centric healthcare. What does it look like, and what can you achieve? Because that's how mobile really ties to a lot of this consumer-centric approach. So. Consumer centrism is, from a business outcomes perspective, it's what we all want. Increased consumer loyalty and retention. You want your patients to stay with you. You want, patients want convenience, they want, we want care protocol compliance, but we do, as part of that, want to make sure that our patients stay with us. I think we all are looking for healthier populations and communities. Uh, we're looking for profitability and, and really, if, if you're in an area where you've got multiple family practice practices, um, you really want to be the one who has the patients. It really is a business and you have a bottom line to do. Um, and you want to be able to respond to your patients or your consumers. And so, you know, how can we do this for some, how can we do some of these things to help them using mobile technology? So we're going to talk about and util talk about utilizing things like patient kiosks. SMS text messaging, um, email, social media. Maybe it's the web and maybe it's apps. Um, so we're going to talk about those things and how you can use them in your practice. So let's go to the next slide, which is a statistics slide, because everyone likes to kind of sometimes see t statistics, and we'll go take a look at that. And, you know, I'm a firm believer that um, to be successful in healthcare, the healthcare ecosystem has to embrace what I would use um, the term or what the ecosystem uses the term of M health. M health is nothing more than mobile technology and the use of wireless devices and I'm going to actually use kind of those terms interchangeably. So again, statistics are sometimes a fun thing to look at and you can see that um, in this slide here we can see that M health really facilitates healthcare shift towards value. There's escalating costs, we have critical resources, explosion in chronic disease. All of these things are really fueling this fundamental shift from this away from what we've done in the past, which is a volume-based fee-for-service funding model that's dominated the healthcare industry for decades to really a more performance-based outcomes-driven model. 
we see this focus on quality um, as there's growing expectations, not only amongst our, our patient population, but among the insurer population. And as consumers become more aware and their access to health information increases, they are becoming more demanding about what we provide to them. You know, healthcare organizations, um, you see this all the time, have to measure quality and make rapid changes to improve. And I'm sure that many of you have had the wonderful efforts of having to um, go through and collect data to provide to the CDC or uh, CDC, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, organizations like that who are driving your payment schedule and you provide this, this vast amount of information in order to keep meeting the standards that they keep putting out. So one of the other things that I think is <clears throat> interesting on this slide is uh, kind of a discussion about the mobile revolution actually being um, attractive to physicians. There's a study that was done, and they say that four out of five practicing physicians use smartphones, computer tablets, or some type of a mobile device and uh, multiple apps in their customary medical practices. Um, so I'd be interested when we have our Q and A first Q and A period for you to tell me if you find that to actually be the case. Um, all right, so let's um, let's go on and take a look at the next slide. And let me ask you, because I think that mobile services have really turned into a must-have for a practice, a medical practice, whether you have them or not right now. So what if you could identify individuals who are shopping for healthcare services and market to them at the right time? All right, perhaps you're a specialty practice who offers something like, who could offer something like that. What if you could listen for what people are saying about your health system in the social media and modify your market messages based on what you hear? That makes the assumption that you're actually doing some marketing. And so if you're not, I would offer that, you know, possibly going forward, you're going to find that you actually have to do some marketing. What if you could build repeatable, consistent, positive customer service and care experiences regardless of the care setting? What if you could push messages to consumers at the right time to help them manage their own health and wellness? I think we'd all really like to see that happen with our populations. And what if you could build a lifetime relationship with an individual healthcare consumer by better understanding how they interact with your healthcare practice? Those, again, I mentioned a moment ago, I think the days of where you went and grew up to, with the doctor, stayed with the same doctor, and never changed, those days are long gone. We've seen patients, I'm sure you have too, change for a variety of reasons. Um, so I have a, st a study that I want to tell you about, um, and I'm probably not pronouncing this organization correctly. It's, called, it's pronounced Ponymon, P-O-N-E-M-O-N. The Ponymon Institute did a study in May of 2013. One of the things that they indicated was that clinicians waste an average of more than 45 minutes each day due to the use of outdated communications technologies. Um, and they went on to state that the primary reason is the inefficiency of pagers, um, and about 52% of the respondents indicated that. And so how often, how many times have you paged a doc and waited for them to call back? Um, and then when they called back, you weren't by the phone, they had to track you down. Then the next item had to do with a lack of Wi-Fi avail availability. And so in your practices, are you set up for, some t for the appropriate wireless environment to do some of these things with mobile? The inadequacy of email and the inability to use text messaging. Now there's, you know, some some pros and cons to using email and text messaging, um, and those predominantly can tie to security as well as billing issues or the inability to bill more precisely. Um, in an inpatient setting, this same study talked about um, deficiencies in communications that lengthen patient discharge times. So currently, a patient discharge time apparently averages about 101 minutes based on this study. But I would offer to you that if you've ever actually been an inpatient in the hospital, when you're told you want, you, that you can go home by the doctor, you really just want to get up and go home right then. You don't want to sit around waiting for 101 minutes <clears throat> while all of the things that have to occur actually have to occur. So 65% um, of respondents also believe that secure text messaging can cut discharge time by about 50, per, 50 minutes um, per event. So 
if you can eliminate some of the outdated communications technologies and start to bring in some of the new technologies, which include mobile, then you can reduce some of these times. And really what the end result is, that leads to a better patient experience. Leading to a better patient experience leads to loyalty. Leading to loyalty leads your patients to want to stay with you. So, so how do we help? Um, you know, how do we help engage the, the, the patient, the consumer, um, and make them want to stay with us in new ways by using mobile, okay? So mobile drives engagement with the individual because we know that they're holding this device in their hand and they're, it's very intimate and it's attached to them. Um, it can often improve care management through better coordination, and I'm going to talk about that in just a few minutes. It can provide insights into care for individual needs, some social support and clinical factors. Um, and it really, it kind of gives the opportunity for better patient outcomes through accountable patient adherence and trying to get the patient involved in their own uh, care. So let me ask you to um, consider this, uh, this statement. If you think about apps and using a smartphone device and any apps that you might have used, all right, let me ask you about this. The last, see if you agree with this, the last best experience that anyone has anywhere becomes the minimum, minimum experience they want everywhere. Okay, so you think about that. <clears throat> so we are gonna pause for just a moment and we're gonna take a small survey just so I understand who our audience is today. And Steve, you're gonna help me out here and explain to everyone how they're gonna take the survey and then we're gonna see the results pop up here in just a minute. All right, uh, terrific, Shirley, and uh, thank you. <laughs> Okay, uh, first off, the the first survey question, and I will give you a hint, there is no uh, right or wrong answer, <laughs> is, is the majority of the population that you serve two-legged, four-legged, or the teeth of one of the first two groups? Now, to um, answer this question, it really would be helpful if everyone would take a moment, and you can even even use your mobile device, uh, speaking of mobile devices, to answer the question if you'd like on your mobile browser or simply open another browser session. But just go to healthsense.com slash Q1. That's healthsense, H-E-A-L-T-H-C-E-N-T-S dot com slash Q1. And you'll be presented with these three options. Now, to display how that works, I will bring up uh, my browser. And you can see that all I do is I go to healthsense.com slash Q1 and am presented with the three choices. So I'll give you folks just a moment, please, to go to healthsense.com slash Q1 and answer the question about the majority of the population that you serve. And mm -hmm. uh, Shirley will give us uh, some insight based on that. Okay, let me head over there and see if we have a critical mass of replies just yet. Okay, we do, that's terrific. And I appreciate, uh, I already have 11 respondents. So Shirley, if uh, you take a look at the screen here, uh, you can see based on the 11 who just uh, responded, the results. Okay, well, that's actually very helpful, and thank you for that, because I do confess the large majority of the presentation really is targeted to the two-legged audience, um, in particular when we get into some of the case studies and things that you could do, you really actually find them more from the two-legged healthcare perspective being applicable than not at all to the dental um, world, and maybe with a stretch to the four-legged world. So thanks for that information. It's, it's helpful to know who's out there. Um, so all right, so the focus, I wanna talk about, let's go on to the next slide then, Steve. And you're going to see this, this kind of depiction of a little family here in the center. And um, at the center of this family is what, what I'm going to term smarter health care <clears throat> for, for our discussion today. So the smarter, when I say smarter health care, what I'm talking about is really an increasingly more personalized experience um, that really focuses on the wellness of the individual and where smarter health systems work together in an integrated um, and collaborative team type of approach with the individual at the center. 
So again, I mentioned on the slide you're seeing this family at the center of this healthier society surrounded by you know, kind of a view of a family, responsibilities in the system that emphasize prevention and wellness. And definitely, I think in the healthcare community, we're seeing wellness and preventative initiatives really kind of coming into their own right now um, for the very first time. You know, not only are employers that actually give healthcare insurance offering discounts for wellness initiatives, so are insurance providers. And interestingly, um, even my own company in 2015, this year actually implemented a penalty for smokers as well as wellness initiatives for individuals who wanted to enroll in certain types of fitness and behavior modification things. It was very interesting, and you, you might be seeing this yourselves. When I did my insurance choices back in the November, December timeframe, for the very first time, the question popped up about smoking. So I was curious to see what it would say if I clicked yes. I don't smoke, but I clicked yes just to see what would happen. And that's when I noticed that there is a monetary penalty being imposed for being a smoker. And so we've not really seen this in healthcare, but to me it really illustrates um, the wellness and prevention shift that as a country that we're really trying to move toward and focus on. So to follow this diagram around just a little bit, um, enrolling in the healthcare program at the upper right-hand corner where you see the enrolling part or improving your long-term long health and everyday experience um, is a touch point where the family gets to interact with the smarter healthcare system. In addition to the, the family, the health systems, um, and, and I'm going to use a very general term here, health system being a healthcare practice, the healthcare practices or healthcare systems need to engage and activate their individuals to assume personal responsibility for managing their own health, and if they have chronic disease, um, to manage those chronic diseases through access to integrated health information and practitioners. And, and, and so the question really becomes, how can we use mobile to deliver this collaborative care which benefits the, you know, both the consumers of health care and the service providers? And if you've, you know, if you've worked with a chronic care population, and I'm just going to use the example of diabetes, um, most of the individuals who, di who have diabetes and they're under care for it actually are very interested and very vested in taking care of their own health. They want to do all of those things that need to be done, but sometimes they need some reminders to do it. So, so let's, let's go through some ideas about how mobile could be used, um, and, and let's just see what we come up with. So uh, before I do that, I want, to, I want to mention a couple of definitions again. So I'm going to talk about um, websites and portals, and those can be used by all types of practices, and they really fall into the area of consumability, okay? Um, the reason why I, I want to talk about the distinction between a website and a portal is that portals are uniquely developed for mobile devices to ease access of use by the mobile device. So I don't know if any of your practices actually use um, a portal at this point in time, but I'll give you an example. So I can use my mobile phone. I can go to any website. But if the site is not specifically developed as a portal and I access it on my mobile device, I may have um, not as pleasant a user experience in trying to access the information. I might have to scroll up or down, slide right or left, um, do a number of different things in order to actually see the information, making it kind of really cumbersome and difficult to navigate and sort of giving me in general a bad taste in my mouth as a user and a bad experience. So um, I would ask you to think about if you've ever used an app before, if you ever had a bad experience with an app, and what was it that you thought after this sort of bad experience ended? Were you thinking, I am never coming back to this site? Because that's often what we see. So if I don't have a good experience, I'm not coming back um, because it's kind of likely that I can get, some, get what I need from someone else at the same price at a site that's easy for me to access and give me everything that I can right at my fingertips, okay? Um, I'm sorry, I just like accidentally shut myself, shut my window down. Okay, so, <laughs> so when we talk about mobile, one of the things that often comes up is the discussion of apps. And so I know you know what apps are because they're applications that the users access to use. Basically, behind every mobile transaction, um, apps play an important role. They may not be quite as noticeable in some types of mobile scenarios or situations, but there are apps there. And so we use apps and we 
as we try to talk about the concept of personalized experience for the patient and kind of getting them to engage in their own health. Um, again, apps are, are everywhere. Some are powered um, in different ways. And I think that what's important for you to understand is if, if you're making a decision about going on a mobile journey, maybe you haven't started yet, um, and I'm not going to comment one way or the other about, well, I might at the very end, comment about hiring someone in-house to develop your apps or if you hire a company to develop your apps. There's certain things that we're going to want you are going to want to look for to make sure that you deliver to the user the best experience possible so that they don't get a bad taste in their mouth um, about your business simply because of the app and then decide that they don't want to come back to you because oh, that app didn't work, it was such a pain, I don't want to go and do that. So there's also some things that we're going to, to look at that we can use apps for that talk about engaging the patient. We're going to talk about some of those. So they could be you know, things like medication reminders, appoint reminders. Um, I've seen apps that do demonstrations of how to do physical therapy exercises. I don't know if any of you have ever been to the physical therapist and they gave you this piece of paper and said, go home and do your exercises. And then you either lose the piece of paper or you look at the picture and you think, hmm, I wonder how that's actually really supposed to work. Um, I think that, yeah, so yeah, I've seen them used for that, so that's kind of actually a good idea. I've seen apps used to do remote data entry um, for traveling home health care providers. Um, and now you're starting to get a little bit more into the sophisticated apps. I've seen an app that is a mobile EMR. So when it's used in conjunction with a mobile device, it actually populates using voice recognition software um, what the provider is saying into the electronic medical record. And I've seen apps used to, do, to monitor and help um, give guidance on what to do for chronic conditions. Okay, So there's also quite a few apps out there, and I'm sure you're aware of that. There's about 97,000 healthcare apps on the market right now. So just statistically, we kind of have to know they're not all good. Um, but in terms of healthcare, if I was looking for an app, I would likely go to the professional organization to which my practice is affiliated. So as an example, if I was a medical oncologist um, and I wanted to recommend an app for something to the patient, uh, the first place I would go to check is, you know, the professional organization I use, and that's ASCO, the American Society of Clinical Oncology. Or maybe you go to the American Dental Association, or maybe you go to the American Veterinary Medical Association. Um, they may very well be don't know that they're, I can't say that I know um, at all that they're developing apps, but they may have certain apps for different conditions or different disease monitoring that they are actually recommending for, the, for, for patients who have fall within your specialty. So, <clears throat> you know, in terms of, I would try there if you're looking for some apps. So in terms of how else you could use apps, um, again, staying in this contextual manner. Um, if you're in the veterinary world, maybe you were um, tweeting a picture for a lost pet, using their picture, we're using social media, um, perhaps we're using social media for amber or silver alerts. Um, maybe you have a patient who has some really rare blood type and needs a transfusion, so you can send out a, you know, a tweet or a post on Facebook that says, hey, we're looking for someone with this blood type who's willing to give blood. I mean, there's, there's kind of a lot of different um, ways that apps can be used. And one of the most interesting ones I saw was um, on the television show, and I don't really know if this is true, but it seems to make a lot of sense that it could actually work, was there was a story on the television show NCIS, I think it was last year, and this, the, the NCIS team had to find this small plane that had been stolen by a bad guy and who was going to do something really bad. And what they did was, because the the plane was somewhat unique. They used social media to tweet out about um, the, you know, what the plane looked like. And then as people who were on the social media using on their mobile device saw the plane, they would reply back, oh, I'm at such and such a location, just saw your plane. And actually the good guys were actually able to track the bad guy and um, catch him before he could do any really bad things. So I don't know if that's possible, but I kind of really like that theory of, of ways to use apps. So that said, we're going to go off and we're going to take a look at our next slide and talk about um, how mobile has changed how you engage with patients. And we're going to stop um, in just a couple minutes and take a break before we go too much further and find out if you do mobile and how you engage. But mobile really is in cha has changed. I've got some quotes here. Mobile is changing the way that I work. Today, while one productive visit turned into three when my client care app notified me 
of other clients within a five-mile radius of my location who I could check in on during my rounds. This was obviously a home health care provider that traveled around. Mobile is giving me more ways to better serve my patients. My patients can't always come in for a visit. My care management app lets me have a conversation with the patient about how he's doing with the medications and follow-up appointment, appointments and lets me adjust prescriptions or issue new orders. This is, I really think, a great service to our patients. Um, this empowers the patients to participate in their health care and also from a convenience standpoint. Mobile is allowing me to engage while protecting data and transactions. Very, very important in the healthcare world. Um, and the quote is, when my tablet was being attacked by malware without my knowledge, it could have been devastating for me and my practice. Luckily, the patient data is locked down in our care management app, so the attack did not penetrate that security, and my company was also able to detect the, the attack and take immediate action. So items that are really important in the development of the app world. So, it, it is true that mobile is changing the way we interact. Average person checks their phone 150 times a day. Um, I hope you don't all want to do that. 53% uh, of seniors 65 and over are online, 7 out of 10 on a cell phone. 40% um, of the workforce will be done totally by mobile by 2015. Two-thirds of the workforce will, workforce will own a smartphone. And according to Information Week, Four out of five physicians use numerous mobile apps in their customary medical practices. So if the world is changing to incorporate mobile, how do we as businesses keep up and meet those expectations? So let's go look at the next slide, and um, let's give you some examples of how we can meet the expectation of consumers. So you can see from this slide that and I'm sure you see this every day in your practices as you deal with the patients. Consumers, patients have a do-it-yourself mentality. Um, how we interact with machines is very different. Uh, we, we expect more. So what we want to do with mobile is we want to be able to offer them services that we extend beyond traditional settings. And so, you know, basically it, is, it can be something as simple as um, remote monitoring for diabetes or cardiac care. And I have a couple of case studies in here that kind of go into that. Um, the physical therapy app that I mentioned before about how to educate patients on how to perform their exercises. So we want to be able to um, deliver contextually relevant information to, the, to our, our consumer base, our patients, and we want to be able to give them those tools. In that app, we want to use the tools that give them the experience that they actually want. So let's go off and look at um, the next slide. And we are going to look at kind of how the, the patient themselves sees themselves. So they're empowered consumers, and what they're thinking, and this is what we have to figure out how to meet, is they want to be treated like, I want you to know me, I want you to engage me in my own terms, and I want you to empower me. Hey, so, uh, I'm sorry, Shirley, are we on the three trends in mobile and healthcare or a different slide? We are on the... Empowered consumers expect healthcare organizations to slide. Okay, can you, is that before this slide? Uh, it would help if you, uh, yes, it's the previous. Back yeah, up. if you could uh, there, maybe there, there. The, the title of the slide just to be sure we're tracking okay. what you hear. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay. Thank you. All right. So, as, so I don't know if you have found this, but I know that in discussions with a lot of the healthcare payers, what we are finding is that they actually, their, their, their client base, their patients, their, their members are actually demanding out of them. I mean, this ties back to the quote from one of the insurance company CEOs. Um, again, they want the insurance company to know them. They want you as a practice to know them. They want to know um, what, they want you to understand what their preferences are and what to offer them. So, you know, kind of drawing that fine line here isn't necessarily as easy for us to do as it is for them to ask for because this sometimes entails a lot of data. And if you're like most small practices, where is the manpower who's actually going to come and do that? All right, so we are going to go to the next slide. And this is going to be the one on three trends in mobile and healthcare. Thank you. And mm -hmm, thank you. Um, and I want to talk about 
some of the things that we're seeing that are emerging in terms that are challenging healthcare organizations to really re-engineer their approaches. And again, some of these are may or may not be easy for you to implement, but I'm going to hopefully offer you a suggestion about how you can do it, because I know that cost and affordability starts to come into play as a smaller practice. So we spoke a moment ago about extending services beyond traditional settings. So the first thing I would offer to you is, and I'm sure, actually, a show of hands, which I can't see, who is wearing a wearable right now? Is any, are any of you wearing a wearable? Put your hand up. Okay. Yes, I see through the phone. All right. So wearables are gaining significant attention. There's a number of other technologies that, and, and engagement models that are gaining traction. People like to do that kind of stuff. Um, you know, another uh, another way of extending services beyond the traditional setting is remote diagnosis via telemedicine. Um, again, if you are a practice in a smaller location, um, in a, perhaps a rural location in a community hospital, it may very well be that you actually use telemedicine um, to help, you know, sometime with some of your patients who are seen that are, you know, maybe more rare than what you would actually expect, okay? Um, in terms of develop new engagement and health strategies, I, again, a lot of development of applications, um, applications that can do mobile medication management, medication reminders, um, adherence reminders, uh, and they can come either as messages in an email or they can come as, as text messages, SMS text messages to the device. You know, you can use these to record medication compliance um, and then populate into the healthcare record. Um, and I think that actually, you know, if you're taking a medication not as a routine, but sometimes um, in a one-off situation, sometimes those message reminders actually will help a lot. And then the last, um, the gaining insight through data and analytics. This is an area where I, I wanted to just point out, but I hesitate to say that this, in order to do analytics, we're probably really talking about larger institutions, and so probably realistically not profitable or cost effective to do as a smaller practice. But if you're looking to do some, some analytics types of things or your practice is looking to do that, look at how you can partner. And maybe that partnership is with a larger healthcare institution um, near where you're at, or perhaps it's even a healthcare payer. Um, I'm sure you're seeing, even in your own lives, um, a lot of healthcare payers really, really are looking to proactively track healthcare and do the right things and wellness efforts for their patients. And, and so if you as a practice are looking to do that as well and partner up with them, I think they'd be very happy about that. Okay, so off to the slide on the consumerism maturity model. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because I know that um, we're already an hour into the talk and we're... We are less than a half an hour to go, but um, internal to, to my company, we look at, when we look at mobile, we look at a consumer, this consumer, consumerism maturity model to try to get an understanding of where an organization is and what they want to do. And you can just kind of see, um, it asks some questions for you to look at if you're looking for going into the mobile world. You know, do you understand your customer behavior? Can you translate insights? Um, is there consistent customer experience? You know, what does your where does your organization fit on this spectrum? And you know, basically, it, it's about using. Does your organization leverage information kind of gathered at various information points? And how do you gather that information? And how does your patient population access that information to let you know where where they're at? So if you're kind of in the starting world, like most people are, you're over here on the left lower corner in the basic portal type of. Uh, of world, and you know, as you move further out into more um, a more consumerism type of model, you move further out to the right and up there, finally into that kind of amber-colored uh, star-looking cloud thing, and that's where you're doing all of those things out there. That's a consumerism, and by the way, I don't know anybody who's actually at that level yet. So, but if you're thinking about going into a mobile journey, or you're on a mobile journey already, and you want to take the next step, think about where you're at, and you can use this kind of a consumerism maturity model to help you get there. So, oh, we have a polling question. Okay, so now we have another polling question, and Steve is going to help us with this. Okay, very good. So the question here is, your organization doing anything with mobile? This is a binary question, yes or no? And as before, we're going to go to HealthSense 
dot com this time slash q2 that's healthsense.com slash q2 and again to demonstrate uh, quickly just simply go to your browser and your mobile browser would be fine for this too your phone or your computer or your tablet healthsense.com slash q2 is your organization doing anything with mobile yes or no I'll pause for just a quick moment and then we will take a look at the results and would appreciate everyone Taking a moment to participate at healthsense.com slash Q2, please. Okay, let's go see what we have. Three, two, one. Okay, appreciate uh, once again the participation. Okay. So, Shirley, the results are up on the screen. All right, so that's very interesting. Uh, not a little over half not doing anything with mobile. Okay, so we have another polling question immediately following this one. Okay. Steve, you're on and again. Sure. No pressure. If everyone would go to healthsense.com slash Q3, should be in a pretty good rhythm right now. <laughs> and healthsense.com slash Q3. And again, a binary question. If you use mobile, do you prefer to engage in transactions mm -hmm. via your mobile device. And this will be the so last we've gone from a, from a your practice type of question to a you personally type of question. Yes, okay, good point. So this uh, particular question is a question about you. Do you prefer to engage in transactions via your mobile device, such as your phone or your tablet? Yes or no? lsense.com slash Q3. And let's go take a look. Okay, results oh, are... all right, about half and half. Hmm. Okay, okay. So that's very interesting. Um, so for those of you who like to engage using your mobile device and transaction, I would offer that you are almost experts without even actually realizing it because as consumers who use mobile technology, you know what you want. You know what you need and you know what you don't like. Um, and I would, I would offer for consideration that's probably not a whole lot different than what your patients actually want and need. So if we could, um, let's pause for just a second, um, Steve and Regina, and open the phone lines for any questions, because we've talked for about an hour now. So let's answer, let's see if anyone has any questions um, that come up at this point. Okay, uh, let me first free up the lines. Okay, at this time, if you would like to ask a question, simply press asterisk six on your phone and go ahead and ask your question and converse with Shirley. And when you're done, press asterisk six again. So asterisk six on your phone to ask a question, and that includes nothing, your mobile phone. But nothing hard. <laughs> no hard questions. Only easy ones. No, uh, any Only question easy. is right. So any questions, uh, please pipe in right now. Okay, while we're awaiting live questions, and if somebody chooses uh, during this time, feel free to press asterisk six and ask. In the meantime, I will look to my left here, my virtual left to Ms. Regina Vasquez, and see what may have come in on info at healthsense.com. Um, I, I do have one question. Um, so with regard to mobile technology and um, connecting, having an integrated mobile strategy, um, medical practices actually have, um, well, two or three, quote, unquote, consumers, um, the patients who consume health care from the practice, but then they also, in a way, I guess, have health care payers who are, uh, in a way, buying their services on behalf of their covered lives. Um, so do you have any recommendations for integrated, or have you seen any integrated strategies where, um, where patients can, um, you know, like find out if services are covered, or um, how 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 can they integrate those platforms, or what's a good strategy for integrating the two customers of the of the healthcare practice? 
So I really actually, the only place I've seen an integrated type of solution like that is probably not going to apply to most of us, and those would be with organizations like a Kaiser Permanente, which is an HMO that actually has um, most of their own specialties in-house and very rarely actually sends their patient base outside to external practices like the ones like you all are and like my husband is. So they would be the only integrated um, solution that I am actually currently familiar with. Now, I, I do know that um, Steve mentioned at the beginning in the Apple-IBM partnership, and that's one of the things that we're looking at with several of the larger insurance payers right now is developing enterprise apps for the insurers payers insurance pairs that would actually tie into and provide that type of information. But right now, I'm not actually familiar of, of anyone who's doing that um, who, or at all, not even not doing it successfully, but I'm just not familiar with anyone doing it. Okay. Okay, great. I, I don't uh, have actually, any, uh, go ahead, on sorry, the, um, Messenger, uh, one of the folks, I, I didn't know if you saw it flash across, Regina, so I apologize for interrupting. I just want to make sure to get this um, participant's question in. And here she is asking about HIPAA compliant apps for appointments or not. Uh, Shirley, you have any awareness of any of the 96,000 apps uh, that may address uh, appointment uh, scheduling that are also HIPAA compliant? Um, I don't know of any apps. Um, I can't speak really to any to any of the apps that are actually on the market as to whether they're good, bad, and different. Um, I would offer for consideration that if you're looking to, from a HIPAA perspective, to protect the data, that what you want to use is a software product that actually protects the data while it's actually on the telephone um, and when it's in transit between the location of the phone and whomever it is you're sending the query to. So I, I don't know the, the answer to the question about the app, but I really think the solution is more to use a legitimate product that protects the data at the device. Okay, and then a, another question, uh, which you know, kind of expanded a little bit uh, that I saw flash in, um, is really about uh, standards. And you know, you uh, being from an IBM background, uh, certainly know uh, how important standards are to um, the overall broad adoption of technology. And I guess if you uh, take that down to emergency health records, emergency medical records, um, that seems to be one of the inhibitors to really getting a, um, a clear and proliferated uh, both mobile as well as mm -hmm. computing-based solution for EHR. Do you see anything on the horizon uh, that you're aware of, Shirley, uh, where that is promoting uh, standards that will enable mobile and other technologies to um, enable virtually any practice to uh, at low cost to be able to participate in electronic uh, health record solution? You know, I'm not aware of anything that's out there. That's actually really a great um, a great question. I'm actually going to take that question and go back into um, our our mobile practice within the company um, to the folks that work in healthcare and ask that question of them. Um, I'm not familiar. I apologize that I'm not. But I'm if um, whomever asked the question is willing to send to Steve separately your contact information, I, I'd like to ask that question internal to the company and find an answer about if our company knows or if we're doing anything along those lines and then be able to provide that back to you. Yeah, terrific. And obviously that would be a, you know, a wonderful opportunity for technology company uh, like IBM that has the broad infrastructure to participate in. So yeah, be very interested, you know, to I can certainly uh, convey that back to the group and would be happy to do so. And I understand Regina has another question that just came in at info. I do. Uh, I am a clinical pharmacist uh, who uses a mobile integration through Hippocrates for formularies, um, i.e. whether a drug is covered or not or when a prior authorization is required. Um, so maybe he's providing um, an answer to oh, to the question we had earlier about the platform um, as to... Um, oh, uh, right. It's a, it's a software yeah. that actually encrypts it. Yeah, yeah, apparently so. So that was an answer to the prior question or okay. a suggestion. Okay. So, good. Thank you for offering that. Right, exactly. Okay. 
All right. So, Steve, let's go back to, if we have no other questions, let's go back to the slides, and I will talk very, very fast. Okay. I just want to say uh, you're welcome, Viewer 8. Uh, thanks for asking. Okay. Keep going. All right, so we're going to go to the slide that is titled Business Value Connecting Clinicians. Um, again, just kind of, I'm not going to talk a lot about these. Some of these are some case studies that I've come across. Um, we have a great story about the Ottawa Hospital, and you can read the slide yourself to look at um, some of the value of actually doing a mobile platform that helps and benefits not only the clinical staff but the patient staff. And I'm going to talk again about Ottawa Hospital in a couple of minutes. But the Ottawa Hospital basically implemented a, a mobile platform across their entire campus with really just dramatic results in terms of work efficiencies and staff morale. It was absolutely incredible what it actually did for them. Um, and again, you know, I think in, in healthcare, the goal is always improved patient care, but we also have to remember that our, our clinicians, our doctors, our nurses um, are also human beings. They need downtime. They need to be home or want to be home with their, and spend time with their families. And so anything that we can do that provides these e economies of scale and efficiencies, we really want to look at. So my next slide is actually a case study about this. And this is um, a case study around the uh, connected clinician. And it's a story about a, a large healthcare provider in the US. Um, they have 2,000 physicians and scientists, and their patient volume is about 4.2 million patients per, per, per year. Pretty sure none of us are actually that big. Um, but the real story is really around just using mobile and remote technologies and how they were able to provide bedside access, patient record access, to the clinicians, and again, which improved efficiency and productivity. So if you can actually look at the record right there at the bedside, you've got all of the information. The clinician has all of their information at hand, can make the appropriate decisions, can enter the information, um, and it does save time. So I think that this is really significant. And, and for the smaller types of practices, if you have more than one doc in the practice and they do a rotating call schedule, wouldn't it be great using mobile technology to be able to access the record of a patient who's not typically their patient when they get called when they're on call? And that way they've got information to appropriately answer what the um, patient is asking. So we'll go to the next slide, which again is another case study. Um, this is about remote monitoring and kind of care beyond the uh, hospital walls. I actually have two of these here. Again, um, these, this first one is about uh, remote patient monitoring in a home setting. It's actually a European health organization that used remote monitoring to mon monitor blood sugars for patients who were diabetic. Um, the information, you can read the details, the information was actually transmitted to the doctor's office on a daily basis and the clinicians, keep in mind there has to be somebody who actually looks at it and takes an action or some intelligent machine process that looks at it and takes an action. But basically it, it's great because it reduces the amount of time that the patient has to spend going back and forth. It doesn't take up an, an, an not, I won't say unnecessary, but it doesn't take up an appointment that might could be used for a patient who had a greater need. So I really like that. And um, I'm really looking for someone who could come up with um, or is willing to take me up on my idea about five-day blood pressure checks. If you're in a primary care setting or internal medicine setting, you've ever had patients who needed a five-day blood pressure check, wouldn't it be great if we could just send out by FedEx or UPS the equipment Every day the patient hooks himself up at the same time at home, takes their blood pressure, it gets transmitted via remote device to the doctor. At the end of the five days, you pack the stuff back up, it goes back on big brown, and the clinician really has a much better idea of the patient's actual blood pressure because they're not stressed because they had to travel to the office and take the time to do that, and they're you know, their adrenaline is up because they're going to the doctor's office. So um, I, I really am looking for someone to take me up on that. And then the case study on the right is about assisted living. This is really kind of more of a social services type of case study um, about um, elderly who live at home and monitoring them from a, from a perspective remotely to make sure that they can still live independently. So we'll look at the next one, um, and this is the business value. can't actually see that. It's a little bit too small for me. Uh, business value of remote patient monitoring and assisted living. I'm just going to let you look through that again because we're a little bit short on time because I apparently have been quite talkative. Um, you can see like 
with remote patient monitoring, these are solutions that really benefit everyone, and you can see how it benefits the provider, the patients, and also the payer staff. Um, if we can do remote monitoring and intervene from a remote um, piece of information that's sent, then the goal is less trips to the doctor, less trips possibly to the ER, less trips possibly as it, that result in admissions. And so we do some proactive monitoring to help with that. And Shirley, just a, a quick interrupt and point to add to that. Um, and it'll be woven into next month's discussion as well. But very important point here because with remote monitoring and the advent of mobile technologies, uh, the measures such as reduced um, admissions and in improved uh, focus on patient care and monitoring are specific measurements that can roll into a value-based uh, reimbursement where you can actually be rewarded for this both in the context of a traditional uh, PPO agreement with commercial payers as well as uh, through an ACO agreement. So I think, you know, this is where you start to see the direct uh, correlation of mobile technology benefiting the practice and, in fact, the entire ecosystem when you think of it as a three-legged stool, the patient receiving right. better uh, proactive care, uh, the practice actually being rewarded for providing that care, and the payer actually being able to derive the benefit of reduced costs. So it's a terrific example. Right. So let's look at the next slide. This is the case study on um, the remote patient monitoring with diabetes. You can look at a little bit of the details. This was actually an Austrian health insurance company who wanted to focus on diabetes for the obvious reason that diabetes was starting to become rampant in the country. And what I would offer to you as you kind of read through the description here is don't think that something like this is beyond your means as a small practice because I don't believe that it is. I don't think independently you could probably do this. Cost-wise, it's probably not feasible independently. But if you were to partner with a larger healthcare institution um, or even a health insurer, I think that you would find, again, you know, some health, pay health insurance payers who would be more than willing to partner with um, your practice to, and you know, kind of give you the, you know, the cost, and everybody reaps the benefits from this. So um, that this is what I wanted you to see because I think with diabetes and with, I have another one with cardiac care. It's not in in the deck here, but same thing with type of cardiac care monitoring. Those are things that you actually can do if you go into partnership with other organizations. So let's look at the next one. Um, I'm just going to give you a. a few quick seconds. This is the city of Bolzano. This is actually a social services one. This is the assisted living one where um, they basically allowed elder care to remain in their homes longer. And I like this because especially if you're a geriatric pop, uh, practice where you do actually see older population, this may be something, again, in conjunction with, you know, larger organizations, social services in the county or the state that you live in and work in that perhaps you could actually implement, implement for your patients. Okay, so let's go on to the next one, which is um, a quick case study on body fit. We mentioned, I mentioned earlier, raise your hand if you're wearing wearables. Again, this is, this is a case study on how you can use remote monitoring for wearables. Um, this is really a wellness and prevention type of, um, of case study and, and way of using mobile to you know, help improve healthcare and wellness. So again, partnering with other organizations to do this, I think could really gain you some value if you see need for that. Okay, so let's go to the next one. Um, I want to talk just for a minute about, um, I'm not going to spend long here, I want to talk about the fact that, you know, if you develop and go decide to go mobile, there's a lot of challenges, but they're really not challenges that are different than in any other industry than what, whatever other industry is facing. They're, we're, they're applied, you know, our population is differently, but the challenges are really actually the same. So let's go to slide um, 25, which has these great looking fruits on them about delivering the goodness of an app. And the reason I want to just quickly go through the last few slides is that I mentioned early on that apps really kind of are the creation of the heart of everything in remote technology and, and in mobile. And so without a good app, you really have nothing. And so consumers, this slide just talks about the fact that consumers do respond well to a good app. For those of you who answered yes to the poll that you um, have smartphones and you engage in transactions, you probably yourselves know what it's like to respond to a good app and you know what it's like when you have a bad app. And so where I'm going with this is um, on to the next slide about what is a good app. 
Okay, a good app is, um, according to the Forrester Group, um, it, a good app is empowering and context matters, meaning the app serves an immediate need in the time and the place that the user needs, and whether that's checking the weather, looking at a map, um, you know, checking, recording your, your heart rate, that's, in, that's context and empowering. The app is engaging in performance. It means it works all of the time, every single time. It does not crash. And you need the app to be trustworthy and secure. We've already had some questions about how you secure the data and HIPAA compliance. So you need those things to occur. So if we'll go to the next slide, um, this is the key challenges of building a good app. And I've listed those for you, and that's kind of what you know my company thinks are the key challenges. And so what I would offer to you is, if you decide to go the mobile journey, whether you do it in-house or whether you contract with somebody to um, do your app development, these are things that you, as the owner of the process, want to look for. These are the challenges and the things that you want to make sure are always working correctly. So if we'll go to the next slide, which um, doesn't have a title, but it's a bunch of different colored boxes that are sort of jumbled on here. Um, I would ask you, what do you think this is? And if you said to me, it sort of looks like a disorganized checklist, you would be correct. Um, and if you'll go to the next slide, let me show you what it really is. Um, this is the World Health Organization Safety Checklist. And the why it's in this presentation is I wanted to point out to you that when you do a surgery, you go into that surgery and the outcome is that you want, to have, you want to have a consistent, repeatable process for a successful patient outcome. And in app development, that's what we want to have, is a consistent, repeatable process so that we have a good, successful patient app. Um, there's a reason why things occur in app development the same way as in the surgery checklist. It's not easy. It's tough. So developing a good app, we want to make sure that we follow the same processes. So again, back to if you decide to go with mobile and do something with apps, get a company who has a very defined way of doing things so it's not hit or miss and doesn't leave you with an app that may or may not meet the needs that you're after. Um, on slide, the next slide, which is mobile app de development just doesn't happen. Again, kind of um, let me use an analogy. Um, if you're looking for a company to hire, everybody has the best of intentions, okay? But when you do app development, take the realistic approach, acknowledge what's needed, which you probably have a little bit of insight into after today, and then go with that. Um, don't go with, and dare I say this, don't go with the prodigy son of the senior partner in the practice who says, oh, my son can develop this app. Um, it's not easy and not everybody can do it and to ensure that you protect your practice and do all of the things that are necessary, um, go with the professional and, and, and not the, the, the partner's son. All right, so let's go to the next one, uh, next slide, which is these great trees. Um, again, mobile, there's, mobile may or may not to give you the business value that you expect. Be real, realistic about it. There's a lot of things that go on with mobile and app development that are under the, uh, the ground that you don't see, kind of like the tip of the iceberg slide that you may have actually seen sometime in the past. There's this tiny tip above water and beneath it's just massive. Same thing is going on with app development. And if you'll go to the very next slide, um, this is kind of our opinion of the our approach about how we do this end-to-end -end delivery of app development. Um, we want to make sure, just like the healthcare world would use this World Health Organization checklist, this is what we feel needs to occur in app development to actually ensure that the app runs correctly from the very beginning to the very end. So on the very next slide, um, if you're starting your mobile journey, or if you're somewhere in your mobile journey, but especially if you're starting, these four entry points that you can take a look at that I'd ask you to consider, um, build the app, protect it, transform, and then engage. And uh, the engage I want to just mention very briefly is about engaging with your clients and seeing what they want, because that's really what, what it's all about, is making sure that you develop an app that meets their needs. And then if we go on to slide 34, we're almost there, guys. Um, the next steps are the best practices. So I've covered, you know, kind of how different things about how healthcare organizations are investing in the development of mobile apps and kind of how you can use them. Some may be realistic. Some you may not feel are realistic. Some you can do if you partner with other organizations. 
Um, what you need to do is define what your strategy is. You have to have a strategy. And if you had a strategy two years ago and you haven't looked at it, it's probably not valid today. Think about what works for you and what would be groundbreaking and would help you retain your patients. Make, uh, make sure that you maintain relevancy, and by that I mean the most current technology. Things are changing in this industry all of the time, and technology changes. And if you'll go to the very last slide, determine where you are and what you want to do. Um, you may determine that mobile isn't for you, whether it's through a cost reason or you just don't feel that it's for your practice. Um, determine where you are if, on your mobile journey if you want to progress. If you've already started, where is it that you need to go from there? And then ensure that you focus on um, all of the pieces that you actually need. And I really want to just reiterate, consider partnerships that you may not have previously considered um, to, en to engage with for this for the betterment of the patients and for your clinicians because I think that those partnerships can give you the opportunity of smaller practices you may not have. So with that, I'm one minute over. So, Steve, I'll turn it back to you if we have any additional questions. Okay, and actually in the interest of time, let me just uh, conclude with a couple of charts and we'll stay on the line for any uh, final questions as well. First, I wanna thank all of you for participating in today's session and for those of you who are viewing the live session and, and for those who may be viewing this on a uh, recorded session, uh, Quill, Healthcare is pleased to offer you a special discount uh, for those who participated, and that would be $15 off when you spend $50 or more in healthcare supplies, or $30 off when you spend $100 or more in healthcare supplies. The promotional codes are listed on this chart and will be uh, also communicated via a follow-up email to those who enrolled. But you may redeem this particular coupon by going to www.quill.com slash medical supplies. And last but not least, if you would like to contact Quill Healthcare directly, the 800 number is listed at the top of this page, or you can reach out to me, Shirley, or Regina by simply dialing HealthSense uh, Corporate Headquarters at 1-800-497-4970, or at any time, feel free to send us an email to info at healthsense.com. And for those who would like a copy of this presentation, it will be recorded and placed on YouTube as a video, and I will be communicating that in the next two days uh, to all who enrolled, or and or you may send an email to charts at healthsense.com, at which time you will uh, be immediately sent back a PDF version of this particular uh, slide deck. So again, uh, we appreciate very much your attendance. And the last thing I'd like to ask is if you would please take a moment, preferably before leaving, we just have three very quick questions. <laughs> again, at healthsense.com, this time slash survey. And that will provide us with very useful feedback about uh, whether or not uh, you perceived the high value that uh, was intended to communicate here in this session. And, I'm quite confident there there was quite a degree of high value, but we would like to hear directly from the participants and get your feedback directly, and that's the way we can do it, is by you going to healthsense.com slash survey and answering the three simple questions about the session there. Um, I will pause for just a moment, uh, since we're slightly over our allotted time, for any final questions and would ask at this time, if you have any final questions, to please press asterisk six on your phone. Okay, uh, going once, going twice, and with that, I will thank our featured and prominent guest speaker, Ms. Shirley Abbott, for uh, presenting this um, useful information and depth of analysis about mobile technologies and the applicability uh, to practices. And we really appreciate, Shirley, uh, you taking time out of your busy schedule to share and communicate this information uh, with our practices. It is uh, very appreciated and want to thank you and the IBM company for taking your time. And with that, uh, we will conclude uh, today's session. Thank you once again for your participation. Have a good afternoon.